really stand up is right now everyone keep on talking about the education achievement gap. In 1964, there was no education achievement gap. You may not believe no teachers really pushed us on current events and everything. You know, I knew about B.O. Davis, Ben, 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 uh, ben, ben he was a colonel at the time. Colonel uh, Benjamin O. Davis, he was a colonel. So the teachers knew all about those history at that time and kept us informed. Kept us informed about Roosevelt, MacArthur, all those type of things. But they were really on top of things. So that, I felt that education was really great. Much better than what the kids get today. Mm. Let me say something about that while you while you're here. Uh, they, um, <coughs> we had West Virginia history, and we knew very little about African American history. We would hear uh, about John Brown reading the novel story. They didn't take it any further. They didn't tell us what all was involved, who all was involved. And I understand from the older folks that there were certain things they didn't want us to know because those old sla ex-slaves and all, they wanted a good future for us and they encouraged us to go to school, to go to Sunday school and church, to join the military. They kept us going forward, had they brought all of that up when we were young about slavery, about John Brown, and about all of these negative things that were happening. We would not have been as progressive as we are because we would have carried that in us. And we may have been ISIS, but they kept that away from us. And they just kept us moving forward. There were some places where they did talk about it. And there were some places where those people really got hate grind in them and ready to do things. But we kept going. And those old folks, like I said, we were coming up, those uh, slaves of Benign, they didn't talk a lot about slavery. They didn't talk about John Brown. And talk about all that kind of stuff only a little bit, but they kept the emphasis on us. What you have got to do, don't look back, keep going. And I'm glad that they did that because we could have been hoodlums when we were coming up had that all been inside of us. And I just want well, to add well, that. Well, let's a little bit more than what Jim said. And that is totally true. They kept things away from us. For example, the most famous black person in the country, in what you think, is Martin Delaney. I never heard of Martin Delaney when I was going to school. I didn't hear about Martin Delaney until about maybe 22 years ago. And guess where I found him from? It was Jim, right here. The first one to mention to us about Martin Delaney. We did not know who Martin Delaney was. Because he kept away from us, Jim. Yeah. But Jim really brought to us Martin Delaney. Then we began to research and found who Martin Delaney was, that he was a highest ranking black in the uh, in, in the Civil War, and also that he uh, uh, did fight for those things. But they kept it from us. Yeah. yeah. But we, we didn't know West Virginia history, and we knew other things. Yeah. We also did not know about the, the Black Raiders that really was tied in with the uh, John Brown Raiders. Yeah. The people up in, uh, we go off the subject, I'm <laughs> Education. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, you know, I had my grandfather and, and, uh, and uh, his mother slaves up in uh, Clark County, which is right across the line from uh, Jefferson County. And I would listen to my mother, my grandfather, my father talk. And uh, every now and then I'd get bits and pieces of stuff that they, that, that, that they knew. And uh, my grandfather said that when doing John Brown's raid, his mother, who was a slave over in uh, Louisville, Clark County, Say that they didn't know that John Brown was white. And when the word got out, at night they would meet and, uh, and discuss things. They couldn't talk about John Brown raiding, going around 
people that hated him, which most white around here did because of uh, what he did. And up there in Ripon, he killed a guy named Turner. And so they had to keep it real quiet. But at night, they would uh, discuss this thing, whisper it. And when they found out that John Brown was white, they said, finally, you have some white people rather than give it up, give their lives up. John Brown and 16 young white male came here and said that these people were really ready to give up their lives. There is hope for them. Little things like this, we could write 25 books about it, but we, it comes up every now and then, but we think it's time that people need to know about some of this stuff. When John Brown's trial at the courthouse, beside his, beside near that courthouse is where the first school was started, the missionary school I was telling you about. Mr. Dixon would go out in his yard and pretend to be working in his garden, listening at what was going on in the courthouse. This is how cozy he was to the courthouse. Then at night, they would come to his house and they would close the blinds and lock the doors and whisper what, and, and uh, Mr. Dixon would tell them what he heard going on in the courthouse and all that type of stuff. Then they would carry the information around to other people. A lot of little things like that out there that really, you know, that I want to stick, don't want to ever forget. And maybe one day we might get a chance to write about it. Anything you want? Well, <clears throat> the uh, thing that happens with us sometimes is it's always up to talk to bring in the bad part. <laughs> and uh, I gladly accept that role. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when we talked about uh, uh, H. Jackson, it's in the uh, right after World War II. A lot of veterans were coming back to finish their high school, and uh, Page Jackson High School and Eagle Avenue Elementary School were in the same building on Martin Luther King. And I'll leave it up to you to make uh, a judgment, but you had World War II veterans using the same bathrooms as the teachers and the first graders. Now that wouldn't happen today, but it happened then. Very, very unhealthy. The other thing I think uh, we might want to add to what George said about the septic system runoff at, up at uh, Eagle Avenue School, Page Jackson High School, was that uh, the, the uh, septic system would run over Sometime the town wasn't sorted at that time, and uh, there was only, of course, one bathroom for the males, one for the females. But anyway, uh, the system would run over, and during the uh, fall, when you had football season, uh, guys would be practicing in the back. And uh, one of my good friends uh, was a little fella, but there were also veterans on the football team. And this little friend of mine thought that he could run and be a big star. Now one of those veterans hit him, he went in the septic field. And that was it. He had to endure all of that and then walk home. So these are some of the things that happened uh, during uh, our time at Page Jackson. One of the most devastating things that I think happened to black education here in Jefferson County was the uh, principals uh, of Shepherdstown Elementary, Hoppus Ferry Elementary, Eagle Avenue Elementary, and of course the high school. After the uh, federal government come in and says, you know, you've got to segregate Evidently, now, evidently, they were called to the Board of Education 
They had many, many years of service uh, as principals. But all of a sudden, after that meeting, the Board of Education, all of them resigned at once. Now, we don't have any evidence that they said anything about it. But we believe, we believe strongly that they were told that they weren't going to be principals in any of the predominantly white schools. So all of them resigned at once. I say it's devastating because it took away those role models of authority that black kids looked at for years and years and years. And it, they never came back. This didn't come back until we got principals in later years. But I think that that was one of the things that had a devastating effect on black education here in Jefferson County, uh, in Shepherdstown, Hoppers Ferry, and in Charlestown. So I'll stop there and leave it to George for his presentation. Okay, I'm supposed to be talking about self-help group, uh, fraternal organization, and so forth. Um, there are very few of them uh, here in, in Jefferson County, and and those that were here, a lot of them have folded now, and their history is very brief because there are no copies of the records of any of them. Only the main one that is still remaining is Star Large Number One, which we have a very good history of. But let me just back up and, and go from the beginning. Uh, for our self, self help. You know, there's an old saying that uh, it takes a village to raise a child. No way here, it takes a village to raise a child. And that goes back to before, before the Reconstruction period. It goes back to the days uh, of slavery when uh, kids were taken away from the parents and parents were separated to another place. And someone had to take care of the kids or take care of the father and so forth. And that's where they began to say that it takes a village to take care of. Lots of time, uh, one woman would take care of some other, other woman's child whose mother had been separated to another plantation. So this was took place during the days of slavery. But however, once Reconstruction began, it became a different story. Uh, it was more than raising a child. It was more less a strong community had, had to be raised. Not just raising a child, but a strong community had to be raised. And there was some strong community that was being raised for example, black communities. I take Charlestown, for example. There were lots of small communities in here, black communities that had to be raised. Uh, there was Dogtown, there was Potato Hill, there was the Big End, there was the Boone. All these little small enclaves of black communities that had to be raised. Just stop and think, you're talking 1867, 1869, we had black people living there, ex slaves living there. First thing, they had no education, no education, hardly any jobs, couldn't read or write, probably no housing, and yet they had to survive. So therefore, there had to be some type of self-help to do it. So therefore, in these different groups, they knew always had some type of self-help group, either your neighbors or else a club or organization to, to put it on. But the main or the first type of self-help group was not a fraternal organization, but it was the black churches. For example, do you think, imagine that two years after, after the Civil War ended, that Mount Zion United Methodist Church up here was built. Where did you get the money to build a church? They built this church right here on Charles Street, and it's the oldest black church in, 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 in the area. And you can imagine, the, the, had was. I mean, for a hard, hard, hard time to get money because they had very few jobs. But what did they do? They uh, taught kids how to read. They also taught kids how to uh, be industrial. Also how to work in different things. The church was really a foundation for the black community for the self help. It did more than just talk about saving souls. It was really into action. But also, it did other things. We talked about self help. They had circles. They had circles that got together and taught you how to sew and how to do other types of things. So that was the first type of self-help that really took place after the uh, Civil War, the black churches. And same thing in Shepherdstown. Shepherdstown had churches also started up in, in the late 1860s. Uh, and also, uh, churches, for example, um, St. Philip. 
for the SES HEP type cure. Right up here, they fill the fifth return. They use it for a school, they use it for a hospital. I think they also have provided some sewing and stuff for people in World War I that in the Belgium and so forth. So the churches was really a self help in the community. But now let's go back to the fraternal groups. There was two types of fraternal organizations that affect the black community. Uh, the one group, fraternal group, more or less parallel along with the white fraternal group. And those groups are stuff like the uh, Masons, the Art Fellows, the Elks, the Knights of Pythia, and the, uh, yeah, those from what I saw on that of the uh, white organization. But the other one was predominantly black, as far as Galilean and Fishman. So let me just briefly talk about a couple of those, those that parallel the, the white organization. Number one is the Masons. Uh, Star Lodge number one, that's the Masonic group, right here in Charlestown. It's the first large that was set aside or organized here in this state, right here in Charlestown. The building still exists over here. It's set in the uh, lock house, the historical structure. Uh, and as far as self help, they have provided scholarships, they have provided uh, money for other things. They also let the building be used for different projects, been used as a church. And even, they're still doing those things today that they started doing back in 1870-something. For example, people may not be aware that Star Lodge has been working with the homeless for the past three or four years. You know, different churches put the homeless in there, pick them up in the wintertime, put them in the, in the, in the churches, stay overnight. But who moved the beds and the clothing uh, during the weekend? Star Lodge has volunteered to do this. They've been doing it for the past uh, three or four years. And these are the type of self-help things that the largest have done. And the largest have opened up and brought in different type of training for not just the black community, but also the white community. So this is some of the things that Star Lodge has done. Uh, the Masons here, Masons, here the black Masons more or less parallel the white Masons. It just so happened that the black, black Masons more or less recognized as Prince Hall Masons. Now, Prince Hall was a, back in the Revolutionary War, uh, became a Mason in the British Lodge. <coughs> and uh, he could not get into the Boston Lodge, so therefore he petitioned uh, England, and England gave him a charter, and so therefore uh, he saw his own grand lodge here in this, this country. So therefore, the Prince Hall Mason got a direct tie to the mother lodge in, in England. So that is how these two uh, Groups more or less exist. We have the white mason and the black mason, but we have the black mason here, which is called Prince Hall. But now I understand in some states they mix, they mix. Uh, Prince Hall will take a uh, white mason, and white mason in some states, not this state, will take black mason. It just so happened that Star Lodge do have white masons in this in this group, and white feet, white feet in the also. Because all these, all these fraternal organizations used to have a woman auxiliary, a female auxiliary, and it's called the Order of Eastern Star. So we got very active at uh, Order of Eastern Star that do a whole lot of success in the community. And it has black members and white members. The other organization, next one is the Art Fellows. And it was organized around 18, 1885, and it disbanded around uh, 1929. And the reason why it disbanded was because of depression and so forth. And they also had an auxiliary group, which was called a household or roof. And they did a lot of work as far as uh, uh, having insurance policy for people and also quality help them and so forth. It was more or less a self help group. Uh, That also parallel was the uh, white uh, art fellows. It just so happened that a fellow by the name of Peter Hogan tried to join uh, the uh, art fellows and they wouldn't let him do it. So he went to Liverpool, England and joined uh, art fellows there and then he more or less got a dispensation to come back here in this country and then he got his own uh, art fellows started. So therefore, the black art fellows and white art fellows. But it is also one of these black uh, self-help group, control group. <coughs> Another group that is more or less parallel to black and white is the Elks. Um, 
there's the, the black elk and the white elk. Uh, and the, we are fortunate here in Charlestown that we have an elk organization. It no longer exists, but when it did exist, it's one of the most famous ones in the country because they had the John Brown Farm. Uh, the John Brown Farm is actually the farm where John Brown uh, more or less uh, started. They had you know, people in camp there for the great uh, harvest story. But the John Brown helps own this place and use it for a dance hall and referred to it as, John, as the John Brown Farm or the Elks Farm. And their home is out here on the um, 0340. And it was very active up about maybe 20, 25 years ago. But the Elks also more or less, lots of times people say it's a party group. But it's much more than party. They did a whole lot of stuff for the community, like give, they take on different charity and provide money for it. They also have a, uh, what do you call it, a female side of it, which is called a daughter of the Elks. And they do lots of things in the community to help also. But the funny thing, all these organizations, like Elks, Mason, and the uh, Art Dog, all of them had a real close tie-in with the church. And it's enough at all to see all four or five of the groups get together to take on the call. If when the house gets burned down, they would all join in and help to do something with it. If someone needs money or something like that, they all help in to raise it. They provide money for scholarships and so forth. So those organizations would uh, uh, help. But the funny thing about the Elks, you know, uh, um, the fellow that started the Black Elk, he couldn't get in the White Elk. But however, he was lucky enough to get a copy of the ritual that the White Elk said. And he learned it, the ritual. And then he was smart enough to get that ritual copyrighted because the White Elk <laughs> forgot to get it copyrighted. <laughs> And so therefore, they got the original, uh, 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 the original ritual that the cop right on the black elk. Okay. Then there's the Knights of Pythia, and then also the other group is the Strangers, the ancient Egyptian original order of the Strand. There are all these organizations more or less that got Masonic relationships, and this is just upper house. And people always look to the Strangers as more or less as a party house. But the Strand do a whole lot of stuff help. Uh, there is a shrine here in Charlestown, at least in Panahound, called Nile Temple, number 27. Uh, the three of us belong to it. Uh, it's not functioning much as it used to in the past, but the shrine is also one of these parallel groups that go along with what the white uh, shrine has had, and the black shrine. And the, the two groups do mix together on the national level with different things. Uh, we provide uh, money to the hospitals. Also, uh, we work with the real strong diabetic uh, program across the country. Um, also, another group is the Scottish Rite Masonry. There is also the Black and the White, and also do, we have it here in Charlestown, also, which is the House of Jim Carver, uh, for the sister number 192. And that is also a self help group that provides. Provide. When you say self help, you know, it, it's more than just giving money. For example, there's Danny uh, says someone in his family passed away. It's not at all for one of our members to go to spend the night with him at his house, more or less to comfort him. I also go to the funeral, they'll stand beside the casket, more or less to uh, as, as respect. And also, so if you're sick, they'll lay by the let's be by your bedside and they help you. These type of things that they talk about self help you do, uh, provided a financial need that's necessary. And those are the groups I just talked about are groups that more or less parallel each other, black and white. But then there are some distinctive uh, fraternal groups that are just black. And the most famous one is the Grand United Order of the Galilean Fishermen. And we are, we are sitting in the building of one right now. And the Grand Galilean Fishman was founded in 1856. And the purpose of it was it was a more or less a benevolent group and also a financial group to really help people get ahead. Uh, they had banks, they had buildings, they had, they had money galore all over the East Coast. <coughs> uh, and lots of investments. If you go through the East Coast and look at the at the, uh, at the largest, all of them almost look just like this building right here. All of them look like this. As a matter of fact, there was one up in Maryville. It looked just like this one. 
But the depression came, and lots of the money they had invested more or less got lost. And so gradually they more or less folded. Uh, and the building became in disrepair. It just so happened that uh, we were lucky to more or less save the building here. But the guy who lived in Fishman, they were more or less interested in the economic development for the black community. And this is what it is. And they kept out a whole lot here in this community. I would like to open up this building here for meetings about different organizations. Elks met here, American Legion met here, uh, the Masons met here, churches met here, a whole lot, whole lot of uses. They did. And also, they also taught people how to save. Uh, and they also had banking that they would use. And insurance policies. And that. So that, is, that is what the reality of Richmond is. But they also had party groups. So they used to come down, people from the groups from, a, they call them tabernacles. The tabernacles will come in down the Harper's Ferry. There used to be a amusement park out on the island in the Harper's Ferry. And not at all, they have a spirit and the trains and buses come down, and people would celebrate down there. And all this was uh, done by the Galilee and Uh and I guess you wonder why the blacks really want to get involved in uh, fraternal group. You know, everyone wants to feel important. And it was sort of like a prestigious thing to belong to a fraternal group. You know, I can wear a badge, I can wear a cap, I can carry a cane, and I, you know, people look up to you. They say, oh, oh, God, he's a elf, but he's a mason, he's an art fellow. It, it's, it sort of gives you a position in, in, in the community. The same way in the church. Oh, he's a deacon, or he's a whatever it is. It sort of gave you prestige to it. But also, um, Responsibility comes to take over. So that's where the has to come in for our fraternal. Uh, I think we can add that uh, as far as the uh, fraternal and civic groups, uh, it was a, uh, it was through the efforts of the Masons, the Elves, the Shriners, the Eastern Stars. Uh, the uh, Galilee and Fishman, at their annual meetings every year, they would give to the NACP and the United Negro College Fund. So that uh, still continues uh, where these organizations support the uh, black community. I think George gave you a good rundown about the, uh, about the uh, Galilee and Fishman, I think that uh, Donna had suggested it, which would uh, also uh, talk about it, but uh, the uh, fish, at least this uh, hole, the cornerstone is still back in the back, the northwest corner. Uh, we were able to recover that and, of course, put it back. It's very, very uh, important. The Regalia and Fishermen uh, Tabernacles in Charlestown and Ripon, Harpers First, Shepherdstown, and of course, George says in Berryville, and of course, down in Montgomery, uh, West Virginia. So it did have a huge impact on communities throughout uh, West Virginia. And of course, this group, this organization, this building uh, was sold to a, a private uh, individual in the 40s, and that started the uh, recreation part or the having uh, uh, just a little some place for people to buy beer and do other things and then it uh, went from there. And of course in 1994 we recovered all of that and started uh, this organization. Uh, also uh, in Charlestown, a lot of these organizations uh, when we, uh, Jim and I were involved in the uh, Charlestown Recreation League, and we would ask these organizations for money for uniforms. Uh, and you don't know just how much these little boys felt. They had uniforms, and they played in the Charlestown Recreation League basketball game down, basketball league down in uh, uh, Page Jackson High School. And I think that was the beginning, Jim, to develop a lot of the boys that went on to uh, uh, Jefferson uh, High School and uh, brought uh, several uh, trophies back here to uh, uh, 
Charlestown. I'm supposed to speak about it all. Before you quit, yeah. you know, Jim Roy always mentioned about what, what takes place here in, in Charlestown, Jefferson County, as far as the uh, uh, black and, and the achievement, and we are in leadership role. Well, you'd be surprised the black leadership role that has come out of different organizations here, fraternal organizations, just, just, from, Charles, just from Charlestown and Jefferson County. For example, the head of the health in the whole country at one time was a fellow that came from Charlestown. Also, um, the Strimers, they uh, had some, some leadership that actually came on, on the national level that has come out of, out of, out of this area. Uh, the Mason, you know, there is well, four or five past grand masters that have served just from, just from Charlestown. Uh, but the most ama amazing thing is we talk about sisters' organizations, the Order of Eastern Stars. The Order of Eastern Stars here in Charlestown is the only group in the country or in the world uh, that has had three past grand matrons that served as the leader of all the Eastern, all the Pennsylvania Eastern Star in the whole world. Mm -hmm. all, and all the three of them came from right here in Charlestown. There was Carlin Stewart, uh, Dowling, and Murrow Nunn. No other, no other, you know, you look at big uh, Eastern stars like D.C., Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, we got one of them at the most. But Charlestown, Eastern Star, the only one that ever got three of them. Talk about, you know, ladies more or less run things. For example, in the Strider, they got a group, uh, East, uh, 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 a group called the Isis, which is female. The Charlestown Isis is the only Isis in the country to come up with a 100% life membership in the NAACP in the whole country. So therefore, there are lots of leadership and lots of things that really take place in a place like Charlestown. Okay, I uh, uh, think that we ought to, to recognize that uh, the whole civil rights movement was started right here in uh, West Virginia, right here in Jefferson County, right here in Hawksford with John Brown in uh, 1859. Uh, I think that he really pushed the button, of course, there's a lot of people that are disputing the fact that uh, John Brown had anything to do with the Civil War, but I think it's widely accepted that uh, he uh, did do a lot to start the uh, Civil War. We go back to Hoppus Ferry, Haywood Shepard was the first person killed uh, John Brown's raid, and then Dangerfield Newby was he was black. He was the first of John Brown's men to be killed. So we can see that uh, what we're, where we're going is that a lot of uh, uh, civil rights uh, activity happened right here in uh, Jefferson County. In 1868, there was a race riot in Charlestown, but uh, no one was killed. And before I go further, let me this book here, uh, Black History Events, uh, 